Hey folks, welcome back to The Contrarians. We have another episode of a regular edition. One of the two of us is going to pick a Dark Horse album um, from a band, and they're going to champion that album as that band's best album. Um, today we have Jamie in the hot seat. Um, you might recognize him from Sea of Tranquility and some of our shows that we've done in the past, actually. So Jamie's got a Contrarian album. Um, he's wearing a t-shirt right now. That's the band that we're going to talk about. So, But that's not the album that he's picking. So I'm going to throw it over to Jamie to tell us a little bit about Queensryche and the record that he's picking and why it's his favorite or the best Queensryche album. So take it away, Jamie. You had Tim on from Tim's uh, Vinyl Confessions in Correct. March. <laughs> and you talked about Queensryche and their worst album, <laughs> which is hard, hard to argue against. <laughs> right. Um, but he did a pr pretty good... Uh, history of the band. He does a good job at that kind of thing. If I did that, you'd say, ah, this guy's just reading from Wikipedia and you'd be right. <laughs> so what I wanted to do was just play a game of why isn't this your favorite album? Okay. And I wanted to go through them real quick, but not in the order of the release in the order I bought them. So kind of like a walk down memory lane. Okay. Uh, the first album I ever bought by them was rage for order. And the first song I ever heard was going to get close to you. And when I heard that, I saw actually the video on MTV and it was so weird. My teenage brain couldn't wrap my mind around it. Um, it didn't sound like metal, but it kind of sounded like metal. And Jeff Tate, he didn't look like the normal rock star of the day. His hair was like up high and, and a weird mullet kind of thing. He had eyeliner. He looked gothy. And I didn't even know if I liked the song or not, but I knew it was interesting. Uh, so I bought this on a club, you know, get eight cassettes for a penny. And at that last spot, I needed one more cassette. I was like, ah, it's, it was interesting enough to dive further into this and see what it's all about. And I remember loving Walk in the Shadows and I Dream in Infrared. And, and the rest of the album actually took about a decade to grow on me. Well, a little wow. less than a decade, I would say. Well, it, it, you know what? This album's still growing on me. I listened yeah. to it uh, like a month ago. Uh, I listened to it right before this, too. But about a month ago, I played it. I said, you know what? I like this more and more. Even today, into my 50s, I'm starting to like it more and more. It, it suffers a little. I got to split hairs here. So anything I say, you know, take with a grain of salt. But it does have a bit of that mid-80s metal production that a lot of those records had and uh i'm a fan of jeff tate when he sings in a bit lower in lower register um and for me his voice just isn't mature it's getting there but it's not at the place where i like it to be and then the second song i ever um after that the next song i ever heard from them it was the prophecy from uh this uh, soundtrack, The Decline of Western Civilization Part Two, The Metal Years. And that's a weird song because it wasn't on any album. I didn't know that at the time. It got, uh, this is the demo too. So I only knew the demo for the longest time. And the regular version got released on the EP when it got reissued, even though it was recorded during the Rage of Order sessions. So it's a weird little song, but I love the song. I always loved the um I like I listen to this version so much that when I hear the uh, quote unquote regular version, I, I like this one better because it's what I'm used to. And then I went to college and I'll never forget. I got this phone call. Uh, this girl said, you got to come to my room, Jamie, and listen to this album that I got. You're going to love it. And it was this monster. And uh, I went there. Um, no, I did not get lucky. We just listened to the damn music. But um, and I loved it, but this is going to come with some controversy on this particular video. So let's set this aside for now and get back to that one. So after that, I got this one and we all know what this is about. We've all heard it to death. And Jeff Tate's voice is where I like it to be. Almost like, a, when it, you know what, when I when this first came out, I worked in a record store. I haven't heard anything off it at the time. Just got the promo in. And the manager said, that new Queensryche, play it. It starts off sounding like Alan Parsons' project. And I said, really? And I put it in best I can. It's got that do, 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 do. To this day, every time I play it, I think Alan Parsons' project. <laughs> that dude planted a seed in my brain. <laughs> he had no idea the seed he was planting. 
Um, but then the thin line, it's got that low register Jeff Tate that I like, almost like uh, Peter Steele from Typo Negative, which I saw Typo Negative open for them in 1995. It was a really good show. Um, Jet City Woman, I mean, is a big barroom party sing-along song. Della, Della Brown I used to love. Nowadays, I find it a little snooze festy. Silent Lucidity, after all these decades, it doesn't get played that much on the radio now, but I'm still kind of tired of it still. Uh, anybody listening is great. Maybe a little long, but it's great. And if you get the single version, there's a very cool uh, cover of Scarborough Fair. I don't know if it's available on anything else, but you could probably hunt, hunt this down if you want to. I doubt it's expensive. It's probably like three bucks on Discogs or something. But why isn't it your favorite? Well, uh, One and Only is kind of like a filler song. It's got a couple songs I'm a little tired of. But I mean, it's a great album. Who can deny it from being a great album? And right around the same time, they appeared on Adventures of Ford Fairlane, this stupid movie (laughs) with Andrew Dice Clay. Uh, The song is not that good. I don't know what you think of it if you heard it. Uh, Last Time in Paris. It sounds like it's a song that should be on Tribe or something, but it's 1990. So, um, yeah, they went a while without releasing anything, but you had that soundtrack, and then you had this soundtrack with a great song called Real World that has orchestration that builds and builds and builds and builds. This is a great soundtrack, too. If you just like metal, this is a great soundtrack with Anthrax and ACDC and stuff. So that kind of wet your whistle until the next album came out. But during that hiatus of no albums, I finally got around to buying these two, finally. And this EP is great. I mean, it's got four songs. This is the original one. It doesn't have extra songs on it anymore. Uh, Queens of the Reich or Queen of the Reich is pretty damn good. I heard in an interview with Jeff Tate years ago, they said, what does Queen of the Reich mean? He says, it just sounded cool. It doesn't mean anything. Uh, but The Lady Wore Black, I think, is very mature for a bunch of 17, 18 year olds. You know? And the other two songs are good too. But why isn't it my favorite? Well, it's an EP and we're not going to count it. And it's, you can tell it's a young band, you know, starting out. As with this, great album. I mean, I'm not going to deny that it's a, not a great album. Um, but why isn't it your favorite? Well, Jeff Tate's a little screechy on it. You know, um, he, people might say, you know how talented you got to be to hit those high notes? Yeah, but that doesn't, yeah, King Diamond's pretty talented too, but I cannot stand King Diamond. And between you and me, Marco, don't tell anyone. <laughs> but sometimes I have an issue with early Judas Priest because of the high register screeching going on. And I don't know, it does something to me, but it's, it can also be very forgivable if the albums are good enough. And a lot of those Judas Priest albums are good enough. And this album is good enough. Uh, I would say his best vocal performance on this album is Road to Madness. And um, Take Hold of the Flame is really good, but I would have liked to hear that. You know, I hear live versions of that song like in the nineties and beyond. And I, I like those live versions better. So not my favorite because of a little bit of shrieking and he needs to uh, mature more. So then after I'm caught up now with all the albums, we come to this bad boy. More controversy, Marco. So um, we're going to set this one aside too for now because that just might be my favorite album by them. And then this one. Now what happens with this band is the justifications start happening. I have to justify why I buy every album. (laughs) So why did you buy this one, Laszlo? Well, because the last one was so damn good. I'll never forget I got out of work and um, there was a record store in the plaza that I worked at. And I worked at Ruby Tuesday and I came out and there was a line at the record store late at night. It was probably about 1130. And do you remember midnight sales? I don't know if you remember that. 
Um, so Biggie Smalls, the big double disc was going on sale at midnight. And I was thinking, Queen's right goes on sale tomorrow. I bet you they have it in a box in there. So I'm in line with all these Biggie fans. <laughs> and I got up there and I said, do you have the new Queens right somewhere? And they looked at me like I had three heads. <laughs> and they, I remember them digging it out of the box and I bought it at midnight. And what a disappointment it was. My God, I had to listen to this so many times going, maybe it's just me, maybe it's just me. <sighs> okay, it's Queen right, Queen's right, listen. No, this sucks. Um, I would say the sign of the times is okay. And that might've been a single and you is kind of fun. But other than that, yeah, it, it, you know, the previous album, the one I like a lot, uh, promised land, it debuted at number three, but it fell off the charts really quick. And when that happens to a band, when it debuts high and goes, you know, the next one's going to kind of bomb with the fans and that's exactly what happened here. So why isn't it my favorite? Cause I like one and a half songs basically on it. So here comes Q2K. Why did I buy this one? Well, um, I don't know because I, I was like, maybe that was just a, a misstep the last album, they're going to bounce back. The, the album the title one is off. awful. Yeah, the album title is awful. You're dating yourself calling it Q2K because who even remembers Y2K now? You have to be like over 30 to remember that thing. The, the tour could have been called Q2K and that would have been cool for the time. But an album, no, dude, nobody knows what this means now. But I'll tell you, Falling Down, I think, is the first song. And right away, you're like, oh, God, here we go again. But it, you got to go all the way to the last song, Right Side of My Mind, to get a really good Queensryche song. That sounds like something that could have been on Empire. But you got to go all the way to song 11, and that wasn't even the single. Breakdown was the single, which I can't even remember how it goes. I just listened to this yesterday. Awful record so why didn't you buy it because of it only has one good song or why isn't it your favorite because it only has one good song so tribe comes next and why did you buy this one laszlo well chris chris degarmo's back i have a reason for faith but then you know you kind of think about it he was on here in the now frontier so how much faith can you have i would put this record at i mean oh god the very first song open it made it, it i literally went like this when i listened to it a couple of days ago like I, I i you know what i would fight for this to be their worst album it's probably their second worst album though so that's why that's not my favorite second worst album so i'm done with queen's right that's what i'm saying at this point no more queen's right and then they got to release this thing <laughs> hope again you know and i remember buying this at um at um best buy i went on my lunch break and um there's a dude next to me and we were looking for this album together and we and we grabbed it together and we looked at each other and said this is gonna be awesome <laughs> and then i got back to work and i put it in my computer and put on my headphones i was like no 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 don't screw this up. Yeah, they kind of screw it up. I would say, um, what 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 songs are all right? The hands. Uh, the chase. The hands is pretty good. The chase with Ronnie James Dio is cool, but it's three minutes. You got Ronnie James Dio on your album. Jeff Tate, Ronnie James Dio. Oh, we're gonna do a three minute song. I hope you don't mind. Three. <laughs> it's a song no one talks about. You know that should go down in heavy metal lore. And it's the song no one talks about. And the single, I'm an American, is kind of, I remember hearing it for the first time. It's kind of almost like speed metal. I'm like, yeah, this is cool. I like it. Or am I fake liking it? Am I trying to like it too much? I think I'm trying to like it too much. But it's not an awful song. It probably kicks butt live, I would imagine. 
Then comes this. Oh, Jamie, why are you keep why do you keep buying them? Well, it's a covers album. They haven't written any of the songs. And maybe, just maybe, they need to do other people's songs to get their mojo back, to get the flow back, you know? And they're doing Welcome to the Machine. That, that sounds like it's in their ballpark, and it's not a bad song. Innuendo, I expected a little bit more. But this is when this album gets weird. They do Almost Cut My Hair, which is a Crosby, Crosby, Stills, and Nash and Young song. And it goes into For What It's Worth, which is a Stephen Still song when he was with Buffalo Springfield. And it was a CSN staple in their live shows for decades. So it starts to sound like a Crosby, Stills, and Nash <laughs> a tribute album. So... Yeah, I mean, not everything on here is a mess, but man, Bullet the Blue Sky. When you 2 did it and Bono started talking, you know, it, it kind of sounded cool. When Jeff Tate does it on here, the live version, he starts to sound a little douchey. He starts to sound a lot douchey, actually. <laughs> so, yeah, it's hit and miss, but mostly misses. And then comes American Soldier. Laszlo, <laughs> when are you going to throw in the towel? But, but, but this is something Jeff Tate is passionate about. You know, the American Soldier and the Armed Forces. That will get his mojo back for sure. That will get the creativity going for sure. And it takes about two seconds to put the CD in. And you hear uh, on Sliver, the opening line, on your feet. Oh, uh, crap. <laughs> nope. So why isn't this my favorite? Because it was a good idea that deserved a better execution. And then came this one, you and Tim's favorite album. It is their worst. And you say, Laszlo, why did you buy this? I didn't. This is a prop. I made this. I printed this out from the computer. It's a fake CD. As with this, <laughs> um, this is fake too. I never bought it, but you know what? I have the digital version of it. So I do own it, the MP3s. Uh, it's not the worst album in the world. It's not. I thought the, the, the name of the album, FU, you know, taking in consideration what was going on with the band and how there was two Queens Reichs and they were kind of rushing to get their version of Queens Reich released. That is so immature. I mean, come on, Jeff. You know, when I said he sounds like a douche in uh, Bullet the Blue Sky, this kind of cements that. Um, but Cold is a pretty good song. And uh, Life Without You isn't too bad either. But here's the problem with this album, why it's not my favorite. A lot of the songs sound like there's good songs hidden within a bad song. Like you almost just want to pull out the good part and leave the crap behind. So, and then we come to these three with Todd Latore. This one, this one. Do you want to see me pull a Martin Popoff? This one. All signed. <laughs> um, these are good records. These are good albums. The problem, why none of these albums are in my favorites is because when I'm listening to them, I like them. But when they're over, I forget how all the songs went. I, I, and when I listen to them, I'm, I tell myself, oh, that's good. I'm going to remember how this went. And then I forget. And if you played any song off this, these albums and said, Laszlo, which, which album is that song from? I wouldn't be able to know. They're almost like one big album to me. So they ain't going to make it to number one for me, which leaves this one, which I have on vinyl and it wasn't cheap. I bought it sealed too. This is the monster. And let me get the other one that most people are going to defend this one. Now look, I got the shirt. I got the cassette. I got the CD. I got the vinyl. Obviously, I love this album. So the question is, why isn't it your favorite? 
Well, I had all kinds of notes on why isn't it my favorite, but I lost them in this mess. Oh, here it is. I thought I was going to have to wing it, Marco, for a second, and I hate to wing it. <laughs> um, you would have done just fine. I think I would have done fine. So, look, these songs are great. And um, the uh, – what's the sweet – yeah, I found the notes, but it's for my uh, Operation Mind Crime 2. Uh, Sweet Sister Mary, great prog metal. You know, it, a lot of prog metal wouldn't exist without this album. And the last three songs, Breaking the Silence, I Don't Believe in Love, and The Eyes of the Stranger, it, it doesn't get better than that back to back to back. Even though they all kind of sound similar to me. I don't know if that's me. They all cut from the same cloth almost. But that's all right. It works because they're all in a row. It almost works like a um, like the encore of a great concert. They come back at the end and go boom, boom, boom. What do you think of that? So, yes, it's great. Why isn't it my favorite? Well, when I listen to the album, Marco, and it's over, Sometimes I'm, I'm glad it's over. I'm a little exhausted by it. You know, there's a lot of drama. It, it has a metallic sound to it. And as much as I love it, I'm not looking to put it in again anytime too soon. It's done. Cool. Put it back on the rack. Maybe I'll bust it out in a month again. Not so with this monster. Now, this has a lot of drama, too but it's rooted drama. It's almost like a tree branching out. It has drama branching out, but it's all rooted into the earth and it has an earthy feeling. This drama is more chaotic, like a uh, spider web between two plants, kind of just in the breeze. No, not grounded. This is grounded. And they actually recorded this out in the wilderness in a cabin. And I think that's what gives it its earthy sound. It has a big bottom to it, you know? And I love that deep registered voice of Jeff Tate. And it's real deep on here. And the lot of bass on there interacts with his low voice. And he hits high notes, but sparingly. And when he hits them, it counts. You know, let me bring up Bob Dylan for a second. <laughs> Bob Dylan was very whiny in the 60s. And then about 97, 1997, he started getting this gravelly old man voice. But right in the 80s, he had that sweet spot. And this is Jeff Tate's sweet spot. It lasted a decade for Bob Dylan. It lasted one album for, I would say, on Empire 2. So Empire in this uh, was Jeff Tate's sweet spot for me and my ears. So what songs do we have on here damaged perfect example of a great bottom end um i like balance and the prog metal with the earthy sound gives it that balance that i just love bridge probably the most well-constructed song they ever written if you just want to talk about well-constructed pop rock song great i think uh DeGarmo wrote that about his dad who just died recently. Promised Land, right when you thought the band was going to be Harry Chapin, singing about their father, <laughs> they come on with this eight-minute long, really cool prog rock song. It's like a slower uh, Sweet um, sweet Sister Mary. I, I always forget the name of that song. Uh, it's like a slower version of that. And the saxophone works. Maybe later they brought out the sax too much, but it just adds layers to this song. Uh, it's not too pronounced. Disconnected. I am I and Disconnected are odd songs because they work on here, but I don't, if they would have recorded those songs later in the 2000s, I don't know if they would have worked. And in other hands, those songs probably would have sucked. But somehow they pulled off these, they're very delicate songs. I, I like to compare them to, there's a fish out there called the fugu. Very poisonous if you eat it. You have to have the right person to prepare that fish to take out the poison very carefully <laughs> and so you don't get poisoned. Those two songs are the fugu of Queensryche songs. 
because they have to be precise on, on handling it. And it worked. It became a great dish instead of a poisonous dish. One more time around should have been a massive hit. I mean, one more time around is all I ask for now. That's great stuff. And, and it, and every great album like this needs that shout out moment. You know, that one part that you like to shout out with the song, or maybe you hear it in concert and, and you're quiet the whole time until that one line. And the shout out moment for this is do what you're told, buy what you're sold, invest in gold and never get old. I've been shouting that out to this album for, uh, do the math. Is it 26 years now? Jeez, 26 years. And then someone else, I'm going to say it right now, the very last song is just Jeff Tate and the piano, his best vocal performance ever, ever. In the last three seconds, he changes octaves about three times in about three or four seconds. First time I ever heard it, I thought it was amazing. And I would play it for people. I like, wait to the last, wait for it. Wait, did you hear it? And a lot of people go, yeah, Laszlo, I heard it. They weren't amazed <laughs> like me. But it did debut at number three, like I said before, but dropped off very quickly. But here are the singles I think they should have been on the radio, and I never heard any songs on the radio. Bridge, Lady Jane, One More Time Around, and just to milk out a single that probably didn't, wouldn't do well, they sh should have released My Global Mind. So there you go. Tell me why I'm cuckoo. Tell me why I'm nuts. Well... It's not like nuts to have like a favorite album or whatever, but it's nuts in this case to pick anything but Operation Mind Crime because I think <laughs> you're probably the only person on the planet that doesn't have Operation Mind Crime as their favorite. Or Can the, I say something sorry, real not fast? The favorite as the best. Go ahead. It's possible to have two thoughts in your mind at the same time. I would agree that Operation Mind Crime is their best record, but I think there can be a difference between best and favorite in your brain and they can play tug of war with one another. And I've made best of lists of Queensryche albums and I've had Operation Mindcrime number oh, one. There you go. That's when what I feel is their best pulls a little bit more on the rope. And then I've had Promised Land. That's when my favorite pulls a little bit harder on the rope. So I've gone back and forth for this episode. I'm just, we're gonna talk about my favorite. <laughs> so right. And and like you didn't pick like a bad record by any means or a bad album by any means. Um and it's interesting because well actually I wanted to point this out first because you had already kind of brought this up about um Crosby Stills and Nash and Young and stuff. It's interesting because I wasn't super aware of that covers album, but uh it's interesting that one song that you can't remember the title of Sweet Sister Mary is felt the same way as Sweet Judy Blue Eyes. I don't know. I know. You, but um no, like you know, and a lot of the research I've done, what's not consistent usually is like how the albums are ranked. Like I've found that in a lot of my research, number two is always different. Number three is always different. Number four is always different. What's always the same is number one. And what I've seen from rankings lists and you know us on the show, like we don't just take critic rankings. We take fan rankings. We take aggregate rankings. Like we, we go a bunch of different sources even like band rankings in terms of like what the band, what album the band played the most or what album uh, appears the most or is represented the most on like compilation albums and stuff like this. It's always Operation Mindcrime. It's always number one on like everything I saw. Number two sometimes was the warning. Like number um, two sometimes, you know, I found Promised Lands as somebody's number two on a rankings list. Your buddy Sia Tranquility, he put Promised Lands at number eight. Um, he doesn't know what he's Pete talking Pardo. about. <laughs> his, number, his number one was Operation Minecraft. And he said it has to be number one. He said it's so well put together and so many great tracks, great storyline and voices. It has to be number one. And he cited some of the songs that you already mentioned. Yeah. Um, best ever albums, which is aggregate. So they take like a bunch of different statistics and, and they put it together. It's not somebody coming up with the list themselves. They take all the rankings lists and all the, the different statistics and they come up with the list. Operation Mind Crimes number one. Promise Lands comes in at number three, with Empire being number two. I'll take that. Uh, Rate Your Music had Operation Mind Crime number one, and Promise Lands was number five. Number two was Rage for Order. You know, heavy metal, heavy music IQ had Promise Lands at number two. And they said uh, some of the strongest songwriting outside of their magnum opus, Operation Mind Crime, and thing, stuff like Nirvana was to blame for this album not being higher on folks' lists. 
Uh, with Operation Mind Crime, they had it number one. They said the band nails each moment as Tate delivers the performance of a lifetime. Operation Mind Crime is hands down the best progressive metal concept album of all time and one of the best heavy metal albums to boot. Um, metal Nerd Blog had Promised Lands at number six and cited that it was less metallic than the previous albums and more of a slow burn. Promised Land is one right. of the band's progier, more experimental records. Um, but they put Queensryche 2013 ahead of it, Empire, Rage for Order, The Warning, and the EP they put together as number two. And Operation Mindcrime is number one and said, um, this album is so good that they released a live album of it in its entirety, not once, but twice, and an additional third time as a bonus live album with the anniversary version edition. Uh, set list statistics. The band themselves played Operation Mindcrime the most out of anything that they ever played. Um, Promised Land was up there. They played Promised Land quite a bit as well. Um, that, that came in at number fifth as fifth most represented live album or li album that they played live. Uh, just to go through, to go through some of this, what I thought about it, I thought the production was really good. I thought there was good. I thought it started off really strong. IMI was really good. Damage was really good. And like, there was some good stuff. I felt more by the end of it, it was more like how you rated those last three, like the, the Queensryche self-title. We're more at the end of it. It was kind of like I enjoyed it while it was on. And at the end of it, I kind of didn't really think about it. I probably haven't spent as much time with it as you have. I've probably spent more time with stuff like Empire and Operation Mindcrime, to be honest and to be fair. So there's that. Um, I, did, I did find that it was actually quite heavy. I thought it was maybe even a little dreary in places Thought the production was really good. It sounds actually more contemporary than some of the older stuff in terms of production. You know, it is heavy. It is kind of grungy too, actually. It is kind of of its time a little bit. You're picking an album compared to Operation Mindcrime. It's nobody agrees with you. Everybody says Operation Mindcrime is number one. <laughs> even the people that like Promised Land put it at number two. No one's right? going to agree with me in the comments either. <laughs> Zero. And, and there's other songs. You mentioned some of the songs all Operation Mindcrime, but like even right off the bat, the first track, the first real yeah. song off of it, Revolution Calling. Yeah. That just get as soon as I hear that gets me amped, you know? Operation yeah. Mindcrime, the title track. But there's good stuff on Promised Land. I'm going to throw some reviews at you, some critic and some fan reviews. So All Music said promised land lacks the conceptual unity and consistent songwriting of operation mind crime but it makes it clear that the band hasn't run out of ideas yet three stars um entertainment weekly chuck eddie says the only time this seattle art metal band doesn't hide its pretty tunes under too much pompous noise is when it's imitating pink floyd in the airy lady jane for instance the remainder is divided between trippy sound effect experiments and a uh, operatically screeched melodrama C plus. Uh, and then here's some fan reviews. So we don't just rely on critics, you know, cause people sometimes will say like, Oh, who cares if a critic likes or not likes, I'm just trying to, I mean, this is a debate. So these are, you know, I'm trying to show you the general consensus is some people are kind of more down on your record than they are on the consensus, which seems to be operation mind crime. Uh, here's some fan reviews um, that I found from from different sources. Some of these are from All Music. Some I think one of these is from Discogs. One of these is from Encyclopedia Metallum. Uh, here's one: some good songs, but mostly boring and pretentious. Here's another one: the ponderous, overly ambitious tracks that don't sync in properly. The '90s had some great bands, yes, but Queenstrike he clearly read the weather wrong here and would have done better creating something with the urgency and unabashedly '80s rock and flavor of their 1990 record Empire. Another one says, rather than creating a version update of their hit radio ballad, Silent Lucidity, they offer nearly 50 minutes of audio that most listeners won't remember and repeated listens only really reward in terms of fussy production volume. Here's another one. Uh, isn't so, it isn't so much a progressive metal album as it is a rock album that tries way too hard to be progressive. The high collection of ballads such as Out of My Mind, Bridge, Lady Jane, and Someone Else really steals any thunder that this album would attempt to have. And all that turns, and it turns everything into easy listening music. In short, this is something to be ignored unless you like listening to a bad version of Pink Floyd album with 90s production. So I, I will say that there is quite a bit, quite a few ballads on here, but I wouldn't say, like, I don't hate ballads and I wouldn't say that they're power ballads. Because I know, you know, Moody. bands, 
Yeah, I'd say they're like what Martin says. They're more like dirges and kind of, you know, that kind of thing. So I, I wasn't super offended by the ballads on here, but there was there were a lot of ballads. There was a lot of mid tempo and slow tempo song tempo songs on this record. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that's fair? Well, obviously, the world doesn't know what they're talking about, <laughs> and I'm the only right person in the world. <laughs> I'm the true contrarian. <laughs> um, I mean, yeah, I'm, I, I could see some of those points. Sure, too many slow songs. Yeah, uh, the bad Pink Floyd. Eh, I don't know if I maybe because of the saxophone sometimes reminds you of a uh, Dark Side of the Moon. But you're right. I, this is the most listened to album I ever buy at any Queens this, record album. But even on the, on this record, the saxophone is a little. It's not as upfront as it is on some of the other right. Queens record records. It's a pretty heavy record. It's a pretty heavy album. Which one are you talking about again? Uh, this one? Promised Land, yeah. Promised Land, yeah. And I'll tell you this, I listen to it so much that these songs, you know how you can't listen to Heartbreaker by Led Zeppelin without Living, Lo Living Loving Maid? A lot of these songs, I don't sound right without the next one starting. I'm always ready for the next, the first note of the next song. So that shows you how much I listen to this album. So even though it was the 90s, but you know what? I think they got cred in the 90s. Unlike a lot of bands like Warrant and Slaughter, because they were from Seattle. They had that Seattle. Oh, well, they're from Seattle, so we'll let them slide. And they didn't sound like hair metal either. Yeah. So did you, when you first heard this album, did you right away say, oh, this is just as good or better than Mind Crime? Right when I heard it, I said, this is just as good or better than Mind Crime. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I was in love with it. And I was in love with it. And look, and what's cool is on my... The CD kind of looks like a Batman thing he would throw at the Joker, a weapon. <laughs> so, yeah, this is my original CD, Beat the Crap. I know a lot of people like to um, replace their jewel case when it cracks, and I'll do that when I buy a used CD that's cracked. But for me, these are battle scars. This has been with me since 1995, and each crack or break has its own story. So, yeah. Yeah, I knew right away. I loved it. Very cool. <laughs> I had a bunch of CDs like that, and I always thought, I'm going to replace this one day. <laughs> you know? Right, then right. I ended up just getting rid of my CDs, so I don't have oh, I couldn't do I don't that. even have them. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, very cool. Anything else you want to say? Any other uh, final points? Uh, one last final point about those last three songs on Operation that might be just a little bit of a jab on the album. The interludes, you know, a minute and a half here, 59 seconds there kind of breaks up the momentum of those three songs a little bit for me, but you know, great album. Look, four and a half stars out of five, if not five, just because I like promised land more does not mean I like this album less. That's all I got to say. And uh, I want to mention, you already brought it up yourself, but uh, you already drew attention to the fact that you're wearing you you look like you're batting for the other team right now with your uniform. You're wearing hey. I'm on all the teams, man. <laughs> I'm on Team Queens, right? Except after uh, <laughs> Promised Land, but, and I'm not on. Except for the the three comeback albums are pretty good. But I'm just I on love Queens. The, uh, I love the Queens DLP here. hat, though. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. All Very right, cool. put your comments below and tell me why I'm an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Tell him why he's an idiot. Tell, yeah. tell him why everybody thinks Operation Mind Crime is the best Queen's Right record. Don't give a thumbs down. Album. Just tell me why I'm an idiot. I'd rather you tell me I'm an idiot instead of giving me a stupid thumbs down. But yeah, very cool, Jamie. Thanks a lot for joining us. And sure. we got a Patreon page. If anybody wants to join us over there, we're always doing cool stuff over there. We have um, more stuff coming out soon. <laughs> so uh, uh, stay tuned and comment below and give us a like and subscribe if you can. And we'll see you next time. Later. That's it, dude. <laughs>